Bibles this morning to the book of Colossians. I remembered that. <laughs> the book of Colossians, my message is entitled, How Will Christ Present You? How Will Christ Present You? Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. And on that note, I will loosen my tie. Oh. Colossians chapter 1, we're going to read verses 20 through 23. The Bible says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him, to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say whether there be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated, but not anymore, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of the flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, if ye continue in the faith, notice how, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. When Paul wrote this, the gospel had, by this juncture, in redemptive history, gone throughout the Roman Empire. Can you imagine that? Every creature under heaven, everywhere, the gospel had gone throughout the aisles as we read in Isaiah through the Great Commission. How will Christ present you? Let's go to the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our brother Paul who's just written so many deep and profound truths in his epistles. And Father, as we try to dig out today the things that you have here for us, Lord God, I pray that you'd open my eyes, that you'd speak through me to your people, Lord God, and that you'd grant them understanding, Lord God. You'd give us an open heart to receive these vignettes of truth. And Lord, even though I may be preaching to the choir, it's important that we know them so we can pass these truths on to other Christians. Father, I pray you'd anoint this preacher with feet of clay, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, beloved, the Apostle Paul had never yet visited Coloss. The church there had been founded by Epaphras, and Epaphras got converted on one of the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys, one on his travels. And the Christians there started off well. They started off on fire for Christ, but then something happened. In other words, Epaphras left, beloved, and when he left, they began to morally and spiritually and doctrinally deteriorate and decline, and they went right downhill. Preacher, I'm saying this, hence the need for strong leadership in a church or anywhere, amen? Everything rises or falls on leadership. Remember, I used to play the game, follow the leader. Otherwise, everybody goes in their own different directions. And so Epaphras leaves, and what happens is nobody steps up to the podium. No one grounded in the faith. No one stands there to bring that, that uh, constant in the world of variables at that time and able to keep people on the right path with God, would you say amen? You see, but soon false teachers and teachers began to inundate the church and corrupt the church with all kinds of heretical and esoterical and mystical doctrines that led many astray and away from Christ to the erroneous cultic beliefs about Christianity in general and the Lord Jesus Christ in particular. And that has invaded the church right now, Jesus Christ. All of these cultic things, beloved, especially the Kabbalah and these labyrinth, all of these things have inundated the pure faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, hence the reason I'm preaching this message today. In other words, beloved, they were beset by such heresies as Gnosticism. We have greater tr spiritual truths that God has downloaded to us. You know, books have flooded the market regarding that, Amen. And asceticism, if I can only eat the right foods and do this and do that, I'll get much more spiritual before God. And then there was Judaism. Judaism now, the Judaizers had crept into the church and trying to bring people back under the law, the Old Testament ceremonies. And then mystical paganism, beloved, that led, led the believers there into a dangerous and uh, deadly moral and spiritual relativism. And relativity is in the church today. Well, that's okay. Who cares if you do this? That's all right if you do that. See, that's relativism. Relativism. That's it. You see, folks, they started believing the deceptive philosophies that really uh, uh, 
There was no such thing as objective truth that God gave or absolute moral and spiritual truth that God gave or that God required one to believe and obey to be saved. And they were taught that one could believe and do and live as they pleased and worship God any way they chose and still be saved if they made a profession of faith and had gotten baptized. That's what you read in chapter 2. But that's wrong, beloved. They also needed, they said, even though you have accepted Christ and even though you got baptized, but you also need some esoteric, Gnostic, special, spiritual revelations that go along with Scripture to be truly and fully saved. And you hear that today, it's everywhere. That's called super arrogation when you bring in all these other things into theology. And they also needed, they said, to practice asceticism and this, live an austere life with abstinence and self-denial like that. And, and a lot of, we see the monks, they flagate themselves, beloved. That's what, how Martin Luther got uh, converted. He went to Rome and he was flagating himself because he didn't think he was good enough to go into the presence of God. He was crawling up the steps, beating himself. And God says, the just shall live by faith. He whispered it in his heart. And then he started reading Romans, the epistle to the Romans. And then, of course, we know the Reformation started after that. And then the Judaizers came in, beloved, and they, they couldn't keep the law themselves, but they were trying to make the Colossians keep the law. And then they taught the worship of angels. And we see that in Christendom today. Many Christians are worshiping angels. That's idolatry. Or worship saint or anything else other than God, beloved, and that's idolatry. So Paul writes them this protective and this corrective epistle to point out all of these heresies and to show them that they lost sight of the sufficiency of Christ, the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ alone to save them, apart from all these other heretical and unneeded things, that through constant and continuous faith in Christ's finished work on the cross and their moral and spiritual fullness and completeness in him, beloved, they were now complete in Christ, complete in God. And Paul said, you need nothing else to save you. Would you say amen out there? Oh, if we could only believe that. He said that Christ had already saved them through the sinless, shameless, guiltless, blameless, crimson blood of his cross, he says here in the text. And their sins had been forgiven and washed away before God. Further yet, look at what he says in verse 22. In the body of his flesh through death, now notice this phrase, to present you. You see that? You ought to underline that, underscore it. Holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now that they placed their faith in Christ as their Messiah, as their Lord and Savior, as their mediator with God the Father, there was something else that he had done for them. What's that, preacher? Notice he had introduced them to God here in this life and also assures them hereafter in the next life, that is, on the day of judgment. Now that word, present you, peristemi hus, huma, excuse me, means that Christ alone stands both by and beside you as your divine advocate, as your divine supporter, and introduces and uh, presents you to God the Father as being his familiar and faithful friend and colleague. Well, listen to me, that's exactly what that Greek phrase means. God pre Christ presents us as being a familiar friend, someone uh, that uh, uh, will stand beside us, beloved faithful friend and a colleague, making you accepted and beloved to God. Or, conversely, beloved, as we study the text, on the day of judgment, he'll stand by and beside you as your divine judge, as your divine accuser and sentencer, and introduce and pre present you to God as being his unfamiliar, unfaithful friend and a foe, making you utterly rejected by God. So this is serious business of how we get presented to God. Would you say amen? amen. It's important that we understand how we are uh, presented to God. Now, beloved, why is that? Because now you're either an unbeliever in God's sight, now you're either just a professor, someone who's made an empty profession, you were never saved in the first place, or now you're a disobedient and impenitent back, backslider who does not practice the faith anymore, and hence you have walked away from your salvation. And that, my friends, is serious business, and the whole New Testament warns against that. Despite what these once saved, always saved crowd says, 
the Holy Spirit, just let him teach you and he'll point out to you how true, the, how, how false that doctrine is, how true what I'm saying to you is. So this is intensely personal, beloved, because how you're presented to God affects you now and later, doesn't it? So how will Christ present you to God? Listen to me, is predicated on us having an active, living, dynamic faith. Did you hear what I said? I didn't just say a faith, a head faith. A living, active, dynamic faith. You got that? You ought to write that in your notes if you take your notes. I want you to note these three truths. Number one, beloved, the peaceful reconciliation. The peaceful reconciliation. Look what Paul says in verse uh, Colossians 1, 20a and 21. He says, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, in 21, and you, there were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Now, beloved, some two times Paul uses the word reconcile or reconciled here. Now, look at verse 20. I want you to study this so you can see this. In verse 20, he uses the word reconcile in the perfect tense to denote what Christ did and is now doing for believers before God from the time of his atonement on the cross right through to the time of the second advent. So that's called the perfect tense. In other words, like Christ died on the cross, uh, 2,000 years ago, but it still has continuous effects. You see what I'm saying? That's called what kind of a tense? That's a perfect tense, something that happened in the past with continuous results. But I want you to also notice in verse 21. In verse 21, he uses the word reconciled. He uses it in the past tense to signify a completed fact, an act before God in the believer's life. Meaning what, preacher? Meaning what Christ already did for them and us before God, the moment they and we placed our faith in Christ and got saved. In other words, it was now a done deal as far as God is concerned. Now the words reconcile and the words reconciled, uh, apocatalasso, means that Christ redeemed us who believed, uh, who believed to bring us back into peace and harmony with God to bring us into conformity to the laws of his kingdom that we lost in Adam when sin entered the picture. Now, I don't have to tell you this because I know you know it, but sin separates man from God and it condemns him before God, doesn't it? You see, folks, so there was and is a great need for peace between God and man. Oh, hear me now. Since the fall, man has been at war with God and not God with man. God is not trying to fight against man. Man is fighting against God. He's shaking his fists in the nostrils of a holy God. I preached the message to you regarding the apotheosis, how man wants to become his own God. Deify himself, worship himself, do what he's going to be, and be accountable to no other person. You see, beloved, God loves man. He's the crowning work of his creation. God made man in his own image and likeness. And he's done everything in his power to try to redeem and reconcile him back to himself. Albeit, don't you ever forget it, get this, God utterly hates, what did I say he what? Hates impenitent sin and ultimately impenitent sin, uh, sinners if they reject him. So this is serious business, amen? So man is not at peace with God and even sees God as his enemy. Sin has made man's soul restless. It's made his soul prideful and stubborn and empty, beloved, and he searches for God and happiness in all the wrong places to fill that empty inner moral and spiritual void and vacuum and vacancy in his soul that only Jesus and his salvation can fill. Kids think, people think that drugs will fill it and sex will fill it and entertainment will fill it and all these other things, but it will never. There is a homing beacon in your heart that says, I want God, I want God to put eternity in your heart, Solomon said. And yet we search for uh, happiness in all the wrong places, don't we? If I only had this, I'll be happy. If I only did that, I'd be happy. If I only had a different maid, I'd be happy. Well, that might be true. <laughs> but you see, beloved, when we get saved, we now have, listen to me, peace with God. And we also have the peace of God through Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. Amen? In Romans 5.1, Paul says, Therefore, being justified by faith... We have peace with God. Would you say amen out there? In other words, beloved, he is our mediator with God. He is our peacemaker with God. He is our reconciler, our daysman, our go-between 
uh, with God. He takes God's hand and man's hand and brings it together. Would you say amen? I want you to note these three subpoints on the point number one. The first thing is the etiology of Christ's reconciliation. Now, if you're taking notes, that's spelled E-T-I-O-L-O-G-Y, etiology. I'm trying to keep all this in homiletics for you to make it easy, okay? Now, the word etiology means this. It means the vessel, the vehicle, the instrumental cause of how something is done and accomplished. Now, notice in your text, that's the word through. He says through faith here. Dia is that word. It denotes that the sinless, shameless, guiltless, blameless, crimson blood of Christ's cross is the singular means, the singular medium whereby all men in general, and us believers in particular, can ever be reconciled to God and have the penalty of the curse and condemnation of God's law, which is damnation in hell, removed from us. Through the blood of his cross, he tells us, uh, that's how this uh, has happened, beloved. Again and again and again for years and years and years. I've told you there's no remission of sin. What? Without the blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other font I know. Nothing. I mean nothing but the blood of Jesus. Come on and say amen out there. Now get this, beloved. It wasn't just Christ's love that reconciled us with God, although people try to push that all the time. And we know God is a God of love. It wasn't just Christ's cross or his sacrifice on the cross. It wasn't just Christ's death that reconciled us with God. It was the sinless, shameless, guiltless, blameless blood, the crimson blood that reconciled us with God. Would you say amen? It's the blood that brings us peace with our God. And believing this is the only way man can ever get right with God and also the only way how Christ is our divine mediator and reconciler in the heavens is now able to present us to God as his friends, to present us to God as his saints, to present us to God as his sons. You see, folks, it's our faith in the precious and priceless crimson blood of Christ that brings us into right standing before God and justified with God, declared righteous in the court of heaven. That's called an alien, a forensic righteousness in theology, and I don't have time to go into that with you. But God, you're, not, you're not righteous when you get saved. Personally, you're still a sinner like, like, like you were before. But when Christ sanctified you, when he called you, when he saved you, you were declared righteous. That's justified. He declared you righteous. Then he developed you righteous by sanctifying you. Would you say amen out there? Amen. God never leaves you as the way you are. Christians today think that all they got to do is accept Jesus, and that's it. Now, beloved, the scripture teaches infinitely more than that. That's like, say, being a plumber. Uh, or a brand of, all I need is a monkey wrench, and I'm all set. Now, I've tried that. It don't work. <laughs> My basement got flooded, right? So what am I saying to you, beloved? I'm saying this, that our faith in the precious blood of Christ is the only thing that can make us say, beloved. All these other things, mysticism, spiritualism, the Kabbalah, worshiping of angels, meditation, these are satanic, occultic ruses meant to deceive you so you think that you're spiritual and acceptable with God. But if you don't repent of your sins and accept Christ as your Savior, if you're not baptized into Christ, you're a wicked sinner. You have wicked works in your life. These other things do nothing for you. Would you say amen? You know, Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, right, the physical exercise profiteth little. In other words, it's of some value for a little time. But godliness is profitable unto the life that now is and that which is yet to come. So we would ought to be practicing a lot more godliness than we do physical exercise, amen? Because it only blesses us here, but it blesses us hereafter. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, that's the etiology of Christ's reconciliation. The Colossians had forgotten that, and sadly, many Christians in the church today, they also forget that. Number two, I want you to see the extent of Christ's reconciliation. Look what he says in verse 20b. He says, by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Now the two words, all things, is the Greek word pas, P-A-S, pas. 
And it denotes the broad, all-encompassing scope, the scale, the spectrum, if you will, of Christ's reconciling work through the blood of his cross at Calvary. Now, beloved, I want you to notice this includes everything and everyone, Paul says, in heaven and earth. Why is that preach up? Because heaven and earth, the things that were, the, the planets, the, beloved, were created to sustain man's life. The earth was created to stand, uh, sustain man's life. The world was made by God to be the place of man's residence. But when Adam and Eve sinned, God cursed the earth. Amen. And he did it for man's sake. But Christ, through the blood of his cross, the Bible says, also redeemed and reconciled this cursed earth back to himself for man. Indeed, if you read Romans chapter 8, beloved, in Romans chapter 8, Paul tells us that since the fall, all creation, listen to what he says, it groans and it travails, patiently waiting the second advent of Jesus Christ so he will come back and adopt us as his sons, give us new bodies, resurrect us, ladies and gentlemen, rescue us, his saints, and he will reverse the curse on this earth and create a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Would you say amen out there? Hey, that's something to look forward to, isn't it? See, we lose sight of a lot of things. We have such a myopic vision of things. And that's why so many Christians walk away from the Lord. And they get out of the fight. That's like being in the middle of a fight, beloved. And, you're, and you say, you know what, I've had about enough right now. But I was in there a while. Well, you're going to lose the fight. I'll tell you that right now. You're thrown in the towel when you do that. You see, beloved, when that new earth comes, listen to me, there'll be no more sin or sickness or death. Amen. There'll be no more tears or crying. There'll be no more earthquakes or hurricanes or tornadoes. There'll be no more tsunamis that destroy this earth like we see happening right now. The former things will pass away. And the Bible says then paradise lost will be paradise found and restored infinitely better than when God first created the earth. Can you imagine how for the first creation, beautiful it must have been, the second will be even better when God recreates the earth. So through faith, beloved, we patiently wait and look for Christ's return. So through faith, a living faith, a dynamic faith, an active faith, we patiently wait and look for the day of the Lord. We patiently wait and look for the restoration of all things. So through faith, beloved, we look for that blessed hope, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13 says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify him to himself, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And he told them, these things speak in exult and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. And so, beloved, you can see this redemptive work is to make us more godly, more holy, more righteous, not just coast along. That's the faith that Paul's talking about here that we need to understand. You see, beloved, you hear me now. It's a living faith, a daily up-to-the-minute faith that unlocks and unloads and unleashes all of the superabundant blessings and benefits of God in our life. And as I was meditating on this, beloved, no wonder... The Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith is much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried in the fire. Has your faith been tried in the fire? Praise the Lord. God's trying to polish you up a little bit, get all the dross out of it, amen? It's much more precious than gold. No gold can buy you heaven. No gold can buy you immortality. No gold can get you eternal life. No gold can get you into the heavenly sanctuary and, and the kingdom of God. And so your faith, your faith, a living faith, an active faith, a daily faith, is much more precious than gold that perishes, beloved. So how Christ will present you to God on the day of judgment depends on the genuineness and the quality and the faithfulness of your faith. Let me ask you a question. So will your faith pass the test? So will your faith hold strong? So will your faith reconcile you with God? But there's a third sub-point I want you to see here, the enemies that Christ reconciled. The enemies that Christ reconciled. Look what he says in verses 21 and 22. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Wait a minute, I, did I, yes, yes, okay. In 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. 
Beloved, I want you to note the infinite love and grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ here for us. Amen. You and I, all people are alienated, it says here. Apolariao is the Greek phrase, and it means we're separated, we're estranged, we're shut out from the familiarity and intimacy of God. Why? Well, he says it right here. Notice your text, it says, because we're enemies, ekthros. We're hateful, we're hostile, we're opposed to God, and we see him as our bitter adversary. Why is that, preacher? Because we dislike, we loathe his divine person, and especially his righteous government, and stubbornly resist submitting to him and it. Because of our, notice what he says here, wicked works, poneros ergon, because our sinful and evil works, because of our bad and malicious works, because of our lewd and crude thoughts and deeds and doings that God in his law forbids us to do. But we have that concupiscence in our heart. That's episteme. And that means that inner and inordinate uh, evil and passions and appetites in our soul that God forbids. And through the grace of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're able to suppress that so the flesh doesn't get the victory. Would you say amen out here? Or, <laughs> I told you it was a tough morning for me. <laughs> <laughs> out here, like I'm out in the field somewhere, right? <laughs> oh, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying that our rebellious hearts want to be free. We want to do as we please. We don't ever want to be answerable to anybody else but ourselves. Yet when we got saved, through faith in Christ as our Lord and Savior, notice it says here, he now presents us to God as hagios. He presents us as holy that is, as being separated from this present evil world system and now made saintly and sac uh, sacred and righteous and therefore altogether worthy and deserving of now entering in to the majestic presence and residence of the kingdom of God in glory. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, we're no longer enemies of God. We're the elect of God. We're the chosen of God. Would you say amen? And what a wonderful blessing that is to know. As we, through faith of baptism, we yoke our life, as I said last week, we yoke our destiny to Christ, and God now sees us in Christ as being holy, righteous, and godly in Him. And no longer does He see us as a sinner or a rebel or a wicked beloved, but as being reconciled to Him as His children. God sees us as penitent sinners who become saints. Now listen to me, follow me now, because it's important you understand this. He sees us as penitent sinners who have become what? Saints who want to now separate from sin, who want to now separate from Satan in this kingdom of darkness, who want to now separate from our former evil, wicked works, beloved, and follow his, live, his son Jesus Christ and be able to live a holy, righteous, and godly life that's well-pleasing to him and well-pleasing to heaven and worthy of his redemption on the cross for us. Would you say amen? It's important we understand that because a lot of Christians think, once I accepted Jesus, that's it, and that's not true. You just began a journey. And will you finish the journey is the key. And that's why you have to have a living, active, dynamic faith. And so therefore now Christ presents us to God. Notice your text. He says, unblameable, armamos, that is without moral and spiritual faults and spots or blemish. Not only that, he says as unreprovable and ekletos in God's sight. Together these two words mean that now... Neither God nor man should any longer be able to accuse us or indict us of any sinful, immoral, corrupt behavior or words. That's what it means to be blameless. It does not mean, beloved, that we're perfect yet, because we're not perfect yet. But daily we're striving, we're laboring, we're trying to press on unto moral and spiritual perfection in Christ. We're going in the direction of that in our life. The proclivity of our heart should be bent that way, not toward the world on the horizontal, but on the vertical. Would you say amen? amen? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. How about you? So many people think this world is their home. It's not your home. You're just passing through, as the song says. And we put more time into everything else except for our faith and finishing the race. We need to get our priorities straight. Amen? And so, beloved... We ought to be striving and laboring to enter in, and not as someone who has moral and spiritual indifference toward God or the things of God. 
So many Christians have such apathy and complacency toward God and the things of God, like this is it. And you know what, beloved? As a pastor, and I counsel them, I see how miserable their life is, and they've got a new car, they've got the best furniture, they've got a new, they got all of that, miserable. Because they're, the proclivity of heart is bent the wrong way, and none of these things will give you the happiness. It may give you a temporal joy when you first get it. You buy that new car, it's great until the bill comes in at the end of the month now. Right? The excise tax comes around. And so we need to get our priorities straightened out. But we'll be a person whose faith is daily and actively engaged in Christianity. A faith that's in hot pursuit of Christ and becoming like Him. These are the ones Christ presents to God as being blameless. These are the ones that God presents to God as being unreprovable in His sight. These are the ones that God, Christ presents to God as being acceptable and no one else. Don't you listen to the lie that Satan's telling you that you've accepted Jesus and that's it. Don't worry about it. You're fine. So that's point number one, beloved, the peace, peaceful reconciliation. Number two, I want you to see the precise requirements in verse 23. He says, and you that were sometime, excuse me, verse 23, if you continue in the faith. You see that word? If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled and not be moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Beloved, here we see exactly what God commands and what God demands of believers if we ever want to constantly and continuously be presented to God as being holy and righteous and godly and reconciled and justified before the bar of God in heaven. Now there's two conditions that Paul lists here that I want you to see. Number one, we must continue in the faith. In verse 23a, he says, uh, if ye continue in the faith. Now the word if, now beloved, listen to me. I want to give you the Greek word for it. It's the word ige in, in Greek. But it means this. It means on condition that you do this. It means providing and assuming that you will continue to do this. It means depending on whether or not you continue to do this. That is, these conditions of faith required by God that are to be met by us. Would you say amen? Because he's given us all things to pertain to life and godliness, and he's given us the power of his spirit and the power of his grace to be able to do it. His sovereign hand comes upon us. But it's our will that must make the decision, amen? Our heart, and God will force no man uh, to do that. So, beloved, this denotes and indicates that the one who meets these preconditions and stipulations, the one who meets God's requirements as set forth here, will certainly and surely in this life and the next life be presented as reconcile to God and be the recipient and beneficiary of all of his eternal blessings and benefits and bounties in Christ as promised by him in the gospel. So he says, if, and he says, notice the other word, you continue. Now that word continue, epimeno, notice it is a present tense verb. What is it? A present tense verb that shows constant and continuous action and advancement in the faith by us. It is not a past tense verb that denotes passivity or inactivity because of a one-time act of faith that you made sometime in the past when you got saved as the heretical once saved, always saved people try to teach us. That crowd is wrong, beloved. And we thank God for those who live above that doctrine, but many people are resting in that doctrine and living, going back and living into the world, and they're endangering their soul. So, beloved, it means to constantly and continuously persevere and persist in the faith. It means to continually proceed and progress in the faith. It means to continually endure, go on, carry on in the faith. Many lexicons tell you it means to remain, stay, abide in the faith, personally demonstrated by us living that holy, righteous, and godly life and obedience to God's commandments. That's how you see if someone has a true, living, active, saving faith, amen, whether or not they will obey the commandments of God or their own will. In the Lord's Prayer, we say, Thy will be done on earth, not my will be done. In 1 John 2, 4, 
John warned the Christians. The Gnostics were, in the, 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 whole, the three Johannine epistles, beloved. They were being inundated with Gnosticism, this secret, more knowledge beside the Bible, extra biblical revelation. That was Gnosticism. And the Bible says there, John says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So somebody can say, I believe Jesus all I want. You know, you know what? I got baptized too. But if they're not obeying the commandments, they're a what in God's sight? They are a liar, beloved. They lie to God. They lie to themselves. They lie to others. And beloved, it's a fool's hope to think that you can say you believe in Jesus and still uh, obey, disobey his commandments and still go to heaven, beloved. You know, James 2.19 says this. It says the devils or the demons also believe and they tremble. At least they tremble. They tremble at the fate that awaits them, and most people have no fear of God before their eyes. The Bible says in Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools, fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so many Christians have become fools. I want you to go to the next chapter. Go over to Colossians chapter 2. Beloved, look what he says in verse 6. He says, And as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Now notice that present verb, walk ye, peripateo. It means that as Christians who have received the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, we're to now daily and continually conduct and regulate our life by a living, active, and obedient faith so we can stay saved. Would you say amen out there? People say to me, well, Jesus saves me. Yes, he saves you through faith. He saved you at the cross. In other words, he provisionally, he saved all mankind. But personally, you have to repent and place your faith in him. Amen? So his sacrifice was sufficient to save all mankind, but it's only efficient to save the person that will repent and keep their faith in them. You know, beloved, this denotes that daily you're persevering and progressing in the faith. This denotes that daily as you're walking with God, you're drawing nearer and closer to Christ in the faith. You're trying to become more and more like him. That's why James, the Lord's brother, said in James 4, 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. People say, I, I feel like God's so far away from me. Well, start drawing nigh to him and you'll feel his presence in your life. He'll draw nigh to you. He didn't lie to you. And I believe this states daily that you're obeying God's commandments and you're trying to live a holy, righteous, and godly life in the faith, beloved, and that you're submitting and surrendering to the Lordship of Christ in your life, beloved. And this is exactly what Paul means here when he tells the Colossians and when he tells us to continue in the faith. Would you say amen out there? Now, I'm saying that because we've seen many people come through here that started off good, but they ended up bad. And they're out there wandering around. They have no fear of God before their eyes. They're just enjoying this life, doing whatever they can do. And they will split hell wide open if they don't repent. They'll go to a worse hell, Jude says. It'll be a, they're, like, uh, they're doubly dead. They were alive one time. First they were dead spiritually. And then they were alive. And then they backslid and they died again spiritually. And then they go to a hotter hell. Because now they're sinning against light. That's iniquity. They know the truth, but they won't believe the truth. They won't follow the truth. And it puts a burden on my heart, but I can't tell you the list of people. My wife will tell you. I have one list that I pray for people that will bless the church. And that list, just that list, takes me an hour. I'm not saying that to show I'm a good holy man, but that's, it takes me an hour. It is a labor of love. Sometimes I have to walk in circles until I finally get the oomph to do it. Because you just don't want to do it. But I want to see them reconcile with God. I don't want to see anybody go to hell. How about you? So, beloved, it does not mean to just keep on believing the facts and truths of the gospel without you trying to live according to the demands and commands of it, as many falsely think. And it does not mean to just occasionally obey God's commandments when you feel like it, because they're easy to do, as many falsely think. And it doesn't mean, ladies and gentlemen, that you just trust the Lord Jesus, that he'll still save you and present you unblameable and unreprovable in God's sight, no matter how far you impenitently sin, no matter how much you backslide, no matter how deep you go back into the world. Love not the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, the Bible says in 1 John 2.15. Amen. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of the life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth, he that doeth the will of my Father shall live forever. Oh, how we forget that sometimes. 
complacency falls upon us. We're at ease in Zion. And Christians should be sharpening their swords right now, getting ready to do the greatest spiritual battle that's coming upon us. I've told you for years, we're in for a great fight ahead of us. And a lot of people will deny Jesus because of it. They'll lose their homes. They'll, I'm not going to lose my home. I'm not going to quit my job. Well, listen, beloved, you better lose, better off you lose everything else here, Jesus said. Lose the whole world and lose your soul. Amen. So that's happened all over the world. Christians all over the world right now as I speak are being persecuted and arrested and imprisoned and tortured and harassed and murdered and martyred and lost everything. I was reading about some Christians down in the Congo, beloved, and now the, the, the uh, Boko Haram, the Muslim fundamentalists, came through the village and shot the women, the children, the babies, the dogs, the chickens, the hogs, and people had to flee into the wilderness, and it took them a month and a half living in the wilderness until they finally reached the next village and get some help. Oh, if you were to say to the people, the great tribulation isn't upon us yet, they said, well, come down here. The Bible says in Acts 14, 22, through much tribulation we shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But we, we, say, we don't want that tribulation. I don't. I know, I know that I don't, beloved. But you listen to me. The faith wherein Paul speaks and exhorts us to continue in is both conformative to God's word, will, and ways, and listen to me, it's not only conformative, but it's transformative. Morally and spiritually transforms our life and makes us more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, this is the type of faith that keeps us in a state of saving and sanctifying grace before the throne of God. Would you say amen out there? Amen. Now, beloved, these are the kind of believers, the only ones he presents to God is being reconciled with him in the Bible. Now listen to me. The whole Bible, the whole Bible, I, I, my prayer was when I preached this that it would stick to your heart like Velcro, that it would resonate in your mind, that the Spirit of God would make it uh, uh, echo in the consciousness of your mind, that the whole Bible, the whole New Testament repeatedly exhorts Christians to continue in the faith, to be fully and finally saved to abide in the faith, to be fully and finally saved, to remain, to overcome in the faith, to be fully and finally saved. 1 Peter 1.5 says, We are kept by the power of God, that's divine sovereignty, through faith unto salvation. Wait a minute, they're already saved. What salvation he's talking about? The first, the final salvation. The final salvation. See, we're, God will keep us as long as we keep our faith in Him. He, God keeps us. For example, beloved, the Bible says this in Jude 20 and 21. It says, But ye, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how do I keep myself in the love of God? Well, John, Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. That's how you stay in my good graces. And, beloved, the Bible says, Jesus said this in John 8, 31, he said, if you continue in my word, then I are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. How can you continue in a faith that you never had? It's impossible, amen? If you continue on the condition that you do, assuming that you will, providing that you will, is what he's saying here. The Bible says in Romans 2, 7, to them who by, quote, patient continuance in well-doing, it shows that they seek for glory honor, immortality, and eternal life. But Paul goes on and says, but to them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish is upon them. Now, mind you, Paul here is speaking to Christians in the church at Rome. The Bible says in Romans 2, 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. The Bible says, beloved, that we need to overcome. But what if I don't overcome? Will I still inherit all these blessings? No. Of course not. And how, it's amazing how we shelve our brains. We take half-truths, the part that we want to see in the Scriptures, so it'll support our doctrine, instead of letting the blessed illuminator, the Holy Ghost, teach us all things. The Bible says in Revelation 22, 14, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Blessed are they that what? Do his commandments, not just believe his commandments. Yeah, I believe it. Ah, uh -uh. your will, your belief must affect your behavior, your convictions, your conduct. Uh, 
your profession, your practice in your life. Amen? You see, beloved, that's how you'll find out how you'll be presented to God. And so, beloved, the exhortation in Colossians 1.23 for Christians to continue in the faith is a conditional clause, one that certainly implies that some believers may decide to discontinue in the faith or depart or defect from the faith. Some believers will fall away from the faith. The Bible warns about that everywhere. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, 1 Timothy 4.1. So we know the Bible, Paul is, is clear on that, beloved. And some believers will decide to apostatize. And beloved, I'll tell you, I've taught you before, God draws a line in the sand with that. He will never allow anyone to trample underfoot the blood of Christ. He said, you cross that line and start denying me and denying what I did for you and trample on my blood, you're insulting the spirit of grace. You're doing despite unto the spirit of grace. That's Hebrews chapter 10. And I'll cut you off. I won't convict you anymore. Enjoy your life down here. You won't be convicted by me anymore. But you'll face me in the day of judgment as your judge. So that's serious business, isn't it? Now the question is this, beloved. In penitents like this, what they do is they forfeit, they lose their former reconciliation with God because they walk away from their faith that reconciles them to God. And they do it for many reasons. Like what? Like the cares of this life. Like what? Like loving this evil world system which God tells us to get away from because it'll suck you into it. It's easy, isn't it? I mean, you've got smartphones, cell phones, TV, everything's just drawing you in, trying to get you to think like the devil in these last days, isn't it? And that's why, beloved, I told you, if I had a, if I had a cell phone, I would never, ever be on Facebook. Nobody's business but mine. I don't like gossip. I don't want to hear gossip. Whatever you do is between you and God. Everybody wants to know everybody else's business. Nosy. The Bible says we don't mind our own business. And that's why people have so many problems today. But people walk away from God because they refuse to mortify and crucify the flesh. Instead, they're fascinated by the world, so they want to intitulate and indulge their flesh. And another reason, beloved, people get sick and tired of the rigid moral and spiritual restraints God's Word imposes on them. Now, it's true. We have to live the crucified life. That's a fact. The trip down the Via Dolorosa with Christ is a tough one. But yet, if our faith is real, if it's living, it's dynamic, we're looking beyond this world to what awaits us yet. Amen? Our best life yet is to, yet to come. Other people, beloved, they separate or they walk away from God because they compromise their convictions and they just love to just get along to go along. Or the spiritual battle gets a little bit too tough so they won't stand up. And speak in love the truth like they should, so they walk away. And so ultimately, beloved, there's a whole host of reasons they don't want to be in the spiritual bad any longer. And they're pathetic reasons, if you ask me. So folks like this, Christ presents as a Judas before God and no longer reconciled to God. And folks like this, Christ presents as a betrayer, a defector, a compromiser before God. And they're not reconciled to God any longer. God sees them as apostates, backsliders, beloved. Because of their impenitent sin, they've fallen away from their former state of saving and sanctifying grace, and they are lost again. When you go home today, you should read Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. You ought to read it, beloved. And it says this, it says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, who have tasted of the heavenly gift, who may partake of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, and they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and they put them to an open shame. The Greek says since they fall away, not if they fall away. He's talking about the Hebrew Christians that had left Christianity to go back into the temple because they were getting persecuted by their brethren. And they were Christians. That's what the book of Hebrews is about. Not who made the coffee, right, David? Men, okay. Now, beloved, so folks like this don't and won't be presented as unblameable and unreprovable in God's sight any longer. Once they turn away from God like this, beloved, once they go back into this evil world system and kingdom of darkness, now Satan once again is their Lord and Master because he's the God of this evil world system, amen? So he's just manipulating you like a puppet. 
Thus, in God's sight, they're now a betrayer of Christ like Judas, and he'll forever punish them with a second death and the burning, boiling, bubbling flames of hell and the lake of fire. Now, our Lord Jesus, in his apocalyptic chapter, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, said this. He says, He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. He that shall endure to the end of his life, or those Christians living to the end of the age, he that shall endure unto the end, going towards the end, he said, shall be saved. Now, what does he mean here? The words shall endure, hupomeno, it's an athletic term, beloved. And it means to persevere in the faith and bear up on the all sufferings and trials like an athlete does to prepare and compete in a contest. In other words, he must constantly and continuously train and exercise hard and discipline his body to keep himself healthy and in shape and fit as a fiddle so he can endure and overcome all the pains and the strains of the competition he enters because he wants to win the race. That's why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. I don't have time to quote it to you. But he said he feared that after he preached to others, he himself would be a castaway. A dokimos is that Greek word, a reprobate. After preaching to everybody, he'd be thrown away because he went back. Instead of trying to win the race, he stopped running and lost the race. And it's easy for all of us to do. My great fear as your pastor has been over the years daily begging God, don't let me lose my fire. Don't let me lose my focus. Lord, beloved, believe it or not, not just you folks here, but a lot of people are watching to see me fall. And I'm well aware of that. I'm trying to make Christianity work to be an example so other people, and I'm not perfect by any means, but I'm trying, I'm striving, and I haven't lost my fire yet, praise the Lord, for His glory. You see, beloved, this is what Jesus means by he that endures to the end shall be saved. It signifies and implies having strong intestinal fortitude and willingness to finish and succeed and achieve that lofty goal in your life. It signifies and implies having great dedication and devotion to make it unto the end, to endure. And it signifies and implies having a focused single-mindedness and steadfast commitment to finish, beloved, so you can receive the crown of eternal life. Would you say amen out there? Now, I've taught you many times, especially recently, that we are living in the great apostasy of the last days, and we have seen, all of us here, many Former believers depart from the faith. Amen? You see, beloved, the Bible warns that as in the days of the judges, every man will do what's right in his own eyes, not what's right in God's eyes. Well, I feel like this. This is what I want to do. And it's so easy to do. I could do that. I have to force myself not to do that because I want to do that. I like the easy road. I like the comfort. But, beloved, I'll tell you what I want. I want to grace the doors of God's heaven. How about you? So I'll tell you, I try to keep myself single-minded, focused there. Every day, every day, every day, and every night, I walk out into my porch and I say, Lord, is it tonight? Can I be prepared for you tonight? As I pray and I go to bed, when I get up in the morning, I walk out my back porch and I look over the eastern sky. Is it today, Lord? Is it today, Lord? Well, I see you today, Lord. And may I be prepared to see the coming of my Lord. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 warns us, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, that he as God sitteth in the temple, the professing church of God, showing himself that he is God. That's the papyr at Rome and the final one who will be the great moral leader of the world in the last days that everybody's going to look to for guidance. You mark my words. The reformers knew who it was. Amen. So, beloved, how will Christ present you? Will he present you as a disciple or a defector? Will he present you as a believer or a backslider? Will he present you as a saint? Or will he present you as a sinner, beloved? So we must continue in the faith. Secondly, beloved, we must also be committed in the faith. Look what he says in Colossians uh, uh, 123b. Go back to Colossians chapter 1. He says, And not be moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, 
whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now, Paul uses two nautical terms here to describe those who continue in the faith, must be what they must be like before God to be presented as being constantly and continuously reconciled before him. Number one, notice the word grounded. You ought to circle that. Thamalia. And it means to be established and stable and unmovable in the fundamental uh, uh, doctrines of the faith, just like a boat or a ship that has been stuck and stranded on the shoals of a sandbar. It's immovable. It's just stuck right there. As we see Paul when he was shipwrecked, the bow of the ship was stuck in the sandbar, but then the waves crashed to the stern of the ship and broke it all up. And the second word he uses is settled. Not only would he be grounded, notice what he says, settled, had rayos. It means to be like a ship safely anchored and secured and tied up to its mooring and boring uh, uh, buoy and secure in the harbor. Beloved, go back to Colossians 2 and look at verse 7, a parallel text. He says, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Paul states that God wants the underpinning, the bedrock of our faith to be firmly fixed in the truths of Christ like a solid foundation under a building to make it safe and secure. And so, beloved, to be presented and reconciled to God, the foundation of our faith must be deeply rooted in Christ. The question is, is yours. The foundation of our faith must be solidly built up in Christ. Is yours. The foundation of our faith must be firmly established and abounding, he says, with thanksgiving. In Christ is yours, oh, I ask you. If so, beloved, then I ask you, how will Christ present you? Well, I'll tell you how, if that's what you're doing. He'll present you as being a faithful child of God. Hallelujah. He'll present you as being a dedicated and devoted child of God. He'll present you as being a true and committed child of God. We all ought to say, praise the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. Because that's how he'll present you. And thirdly, beloved, We've seen the peaceful reconciliation, the precise requirements, and I'll close with this, the personal resolve. Go back to Colossians 1.23. In Colossians 1.23b, he says, and Be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, the hope of the gospel, the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. And let me stop you right there. That phrase, not moved away, metitiaki neo, is a maritime term, beloved. It means to not deviate and depart from, to not stray and wander from, to not drift away from, like a ship loose from its mooring, slowly drifts away with the tide and the current, and you can see that boat just getting lost out at sea. I remember one time I was sea clamming out here on Brown's Bank, and the tide was furiously coming in. I was with a friend in a little dinghy, and the sea clams, there were so many that day, beloved, just picking them up and filling up our burlap bags, storing them in it. Next time we turned around, the ship's, the little boat's gone away from us, right? And he says to me, hey, JB, go get the ship. You go get it. The tide is just. And so finally, I so I dove in there, right? And I'm swimming, right? And I get the boat, and I'm trying to come back, trying to come back. And finally, he dives in with me, gets a hold of the, the rope of the anchor, and we're, he's in water. Just, we pull it back. We saved, praise the Lord, we saved all of the sea clams. I made some stuffed clam spaghetti sauce. So praise the Lord. <laughs> But that's what he's talking about, our faith. We just drift away with the current of this world, the tide of this world, the tide of worldliness from our mooring. Our mooring is Christ. Our buoy is Christ. Amen? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying many are drifting away with the tide and the current of all of the things that they have in this earth, the glit and glitter. And they're being drifting away with the tide and current of worldliness and pleasures and just going out and fun and compromise and complacency. And, oh, i got to have my decadence and my comfort. and this. So what if they're in heresy or apostasy? I don't have any burden for my family, my husband, my wife, my children, my grandchildren, my co-workers. So what if they're going to hell? They're having a wonderful time now. I hope you don't have that attitude. It's a burden of my heart. When I got saved, I went to my mother, and boy, she, she didn't want to speak to me for eight years. But she got saved, hallelujah. And my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, beloved, after 40 years praying for them, and two weeks before they died, they accepted the Lord, and we baptized them. Praise the Lord. 
And so the burden of my heart was for my family, and I hope the burden of heart is, is for your family, beloved. But notice, so many Christians today are being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, with all kinds of worldly indulgences that this present evil world system can offer them, and they're walking away from Christ in droves. They're sacrificing the eternal on the altar of the temporal. What they're hoping, the deception is, that Satan whispers in their ears, you can have both. See? Right? You can have them both. You don't have to listen to that up there. Don't listen to me. Read your Bible. Check where I'm wrong. That's, that's fair enough, isn't it? You can't, because if you read the New Testament, you have to be, and you want to be honest, you know I'm telling you the truth. But you see, beloved, so it will take strong determination to be ultimately, finally reconciled with God. It'll take strong intestinal fortitude, grit, tenacity for that to happen in your life, to keep ourselves faithful and focused. Notice what he says, you ought to circle this, of the hope of the gospel, el pis evangelion. The Christian hope is not something that may or may not happen, beloved. It's an absolute certainty in our life. It's not like the world that says, I hope this will happen. I hope. No, no. For us, it will happen. It is rooted on the word and the promises of Almighty God. Amen? It has to happen. Christ can't lie. In the word, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. Beloved, he's the eternal Logos. He's the incarnate word, and this is the inspired word that he gave us. Would you say amen out there? So the hope of the gospel is the positively assured, the confident expectation of the good news, the glad tiding promised to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you some of the good news, some of the glad tidings of this hope that we have. The hope of the gospel is seeing Christ in all of his glory at his second advent and having welcomed you with open arms, amen? The hope of the gospel is the resurrection unto eternal life with an immortal, incorruptible, glorified body that will forever live in heaven with the Lord and the redeemed and reconcile with him in the eternal kingdom of God, beloved, in the celestial city, the new Jerusalem. Are you looking forward to that? You know, I was thinking the other day, I, every, I tell you, every month I read, when I go to bed, I always read the book of Revelation once a month. I mean, it says that there was 12 gates and 12 pillars and they're made of pearl. I said, they've got to be big oysters, boy. <laughs> they have those pillars made of, uh, <laughs> of pearl. I'll tell you another thing, beloved. The hope of the gospel is our eternal inheritance promised us for our faithful perseverance in the faith and holy living and dedication, the dedication to God. How will Christ present you? Well, let me tell you how, beloved. How Christ will present you depends on how you present yourself to Christ right now. You see, beloved, he'll present you as being faithful if you're faithful. He'll present you as being dedicated if you're dedicated. He'll present you as being holy if you're holy. So how will Christ present you? That's my challenge to you this morning. Paul told young Pastor Timothy this. He said, Timothy, you're now the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And you know that they worship the great goddess Diana there. And they make all kinds of shrines and the silversmiths are mad as hornets because we're preaching the truth. And I know you're getting a little intimidated, but I've told you God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But then he said this to him. In 1 Timothy 6.12, he says, Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Hey, you know what? That goes for me too. And that goes for you too. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Your goal is not your promotion in life. Your goal is not your, your goal is to make it into heaven. Would you say amen? That's the hope that's set before you. How will Christ present you? Unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which was presented unto you. 
Let's go to the throne of grace.